First, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Oren Dutan. I'm in a, I'm an osteopath, and I'm the founder of ICS Method. And I'm going to share with you a little bit what is ICS because it's very relevant how we're going to speak about the cervical fascia. I want this webinar uh, not to be only like pure anatomy and it can be quite boring just to hear all the anatomy is that about the fascia. I want to give you like an insight how the fascia can serve as a therapeutic uh, strategy in, in order to treat many kinds of diseases, not only like musculoskeletal uh, dysfunction, but many other kinds of dysfunction, like hormonal dysfunction, autoimmune dysfunction, and many other things. And what is the anatomical explanation, how I work very gently on the neck and why people with many, many kind of uh, diseases get benefit from it. So I want to, uh, to explain you the anatomy and also to share with you some of the, the tests that I'm doing. All the things that I'm going to tell you, it's not a theory. I'm using it in my uh, diagnostic tool of ICS in order to uh, explore this uh, connection and to see it. So this is something that uh, it's very important to say. It's not uh, it's not pure theory. All the theories that I'm telling you, it's uh, back. It served only as a purpose of diagnostic tool and to understand how the system of the body is working. And I'm going to talk about the cervical fascia, not as a separate unit, not only on the fascial system. I want to share with you how it's connected to all the system of the body, okay? And then we'll see the complexity. Uh... Thank you, I mute everyone. Thank you, thank you, Daphna. Uh, I want to explain you how all the system of the body are interconnected and not only so like a system by itself, because the fascial system is not standing by itself. Uh, and this is uh, the aim that after this uh, webinar, you will have much bigger understanding about how the body works as one unit in all, not only in the fascial level, but also in other, in other level, how we can use it in order to treat many kind of dysfunctions that our patients are coming. Uh, so what is ICS method, okay? ICS method is a method that take the craniosacral system as the main axis of diagnosis. That through the cranial system, I don't know everyone here, if they know what is the cranial mechanism, it's uh, the movement of the, it's the skull and the spine and how the, the sudden movement in this structure. So in ICS, this is the main axis of the, of the diagnosis of the whole body, okay? And you will see in a second when I'm going to talk on the cervical fascia, why it's, it's so critical, okay? And what the, in ICS, we are looking about the integration between the cranial system, the, the bone of the skull, the visceral system, the mechanical system as one integrate unit that affect and influence each other. And the aim of this method is to find what is called in osteopathy, the key lesion. One thing that releases everything, okay? And in ICS, uh, we created many, many kind of chain that connection between many, many systems. That this, this chain is connected through the fascia, through the nervous system, through the cranial mechanism, through the inner organ to one integrated unit. And then the therapist need to choose one structure to treat in which this structure will going to release all the other structure in the same chain. So you have a chain with many links and you, the therapist need in ICS 
to find one link that he think is the cause for all of the dysfunction, he treat it, and then if it was correct, he need to, to see that all the link is getting released in the same second. So you have like a very, you can verify what you are saying. This is a like a, this is the ICS, and you will see it in in the cervical fascia how it's implemented. This is why I choose the cervical fascia because it's a main tool for diagnosis and to do the integration. I am teaching this lecture on the seven course in our program because it's like incorporate many 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 things together. So let's start. Uh, share screen. Okay. Okay, what is ICS? We talk about it. Oh, one last thing about ICS that I forgot to tell you. In ICS, we are doing the diagnosis according to five level. The, bone, the muscle, we diagnose the muscle here. We diagnose the bone, the mechanical aspect of the body. We diagnose the dura mater, that is the fascia level. And underneath this, we have the fluid. And underneath this, we have the brain itself. Okay, so in ICS, we want to, dis to distinguish which layer is dysfunctional, okay? And every layer has a different touch and a different sensation, different texture. And the same thing we're going to do to all the parts of the body, not only to the skull. For the spine, for example, I'm asking if there is a problem in the muscle, the multifidus, if there is a problem in the joint, that is the bone, is the problem in the dura, the CSF is the fluid, or the spinal cord itself. And like this, we do to all the part of the body. And the, the fascial system is composed, it's related to the, to the dura. And it's part of, the dura is part of the fascial system, and you'll see this interconnection when I'm going to talk about the cervical fascia in a second. Okay, so we said about the pinpoint of the specific link and, okay. So why the cervical fascia? First, is the main area to diagnose the whole of the fascial system and I'm going to talk to, about it in a second. The, all the things that I'm going to, to, to tell you at the moment, I'm going to talk about in, in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, the cervical fascia connects the, to the cranial system. It's make a connection between the fascial system and the cranial sacral system. It has a significant impact on the endocrine system, okay? And it influences a lot of the mechanical function of the cervical, of the cervical spine. Uh, okay, this is like just a few bullets. So let's start diving into the anatomy. Okay, so the cervical fascia is composed of two layers. Okay, the first layer is superficial layer, and the second layer is the deep layer, and this is you can divide it to three different layers. From the superficial to the deep, we have the investing layer, the pretracheal, and the prevertebral. And I'm going to go on each one of these layers and tell you about their uh, anatomy and its clinical uh, significance. Uh, so let's talk. So here we see the neck, it's a, it's a cut of the neck, and here we see the fascial, uh, all the fascial layer. We see the pretracheal, the prevertebral, and so on. And we are now talking about, you see the, this here, the platysma? This is the superficial layer of the cervical fascia, okay? And we're going to talk about this. So the superficial fascia, you see, it's found between the skin and, and the muscle here. And the deep uh, and the adipus and the mus and the muscle here. Okay. And inside this fascia, 
we have the most important thing it's a uh, innovation to the skin and superficial lymph node okay this is two very important uh, structures that we find in the superficial fascia okay and in, the, in a second i will show you a few more details this in the uh, growth uh, generally on the fascia now the superficial fascia is connecting all the muscle of the face or all the mimic muscle of the face it's part of the superficial fascia of the body and if you see where uh, the mouse the line of the mouse Yossi, do you see it good so here you see the frontalis the galea ponerotica and all the small muscle of the face and here you see the platysma okay so the platysma is the muscle of the neck that is related to the superficial fascia and as you know the fascia is one layer so you can visualize it as a in depth okay so we have four different kind of depth in the in the fascial system of the thorax so now we are talking on the first one the most superficial that is composed of the mimic the muscle of the mimic the platysma and then it's go to the rest of the body and it's connect also to the deltoid you see here the deltoid and the pectoralis but it's not only finishing here it's go all the way to the thorax and i just uh, wrote one uh, one example of a fascia that to call scarpa's fascia that is a fascia in the abdomen that is in direct continuation with the superficial fascia of the neck okay and here we see it again the superficial mass fascia and the platysma this is how it look like in life this is the superficial fascia this is how it's look in reality and scarpa fascia it's here i don't you see it it's just underneath the skin we have here the, some fat it's called camper fascia and then we have the scarpa the scarpa fascia just above the external oblique and this fascia is in direct continuation with the fascia of the neck and if you see here this fascia is attached to the pubis it it's it, it attached to the uh, uh, tensor to the linea alba to the uh, tensor to the fascia lata and you see how all this is coming from the neck it's all one continuation so this is the superficial layer so when do i see it get stuck scar tissue scar tissue you will find the superficial level a lot of the time gets stuck tattoos i have uh, some patients that have a lot of pain and nobody can find why and then i see a big tattoo on their chest or on the arm and i check it the superficial fascia is stuck and then i release it and then the pain disappears in the same second and maybe in a, after the webinar i will send you like a record from one of uh, the classes that I saw in one of the participants in our courses the same thing when I uh, did a demonstration of the releasing of the superficial fascia. And you will see how to identify the area in the tattoo that is blocked and you stretch it and the pain in the shoulder disappear. Okay, also burn also can affect the superficial level of the, of the cervical fascia okay and uh, and it could be everywhere in the body it could be in the abdomen in the chest and it, the the effect is very wide because as you saw in the superficial fascia you have a lot of lymph nodes so it can affect a lot of the immune system of a lot of uh, inflammation process and if people have an edema and so on and this is usually factors that nobody taking consideration someone who come with a tattoo people don't think oh we'll check his tattoo maybe it's influences lower back pain 
but I can tell you it is. Uh, so I will tell, I'll give you a small tip how I, uh, how I check it. When you move your chin forward, like this, the platys might getting stretched, getting forward. And if you put everyone, your hand on your chest here, I don't know if you see me here, where the platysma is attaching and you take your chin forward, you will feel a certain like pull in a superior direction. If you have this pull, it means that the fascia forces are moving correctly. And if they don't, there is a problem. And the more you go more distal, it's more subtle. If you do it in the chest, it's I think very pronounced. I think if you want, you can check it by yourself. And there is also a few other uh, ways that you you can check the superficial fashion. And when you're going to touch a certain area, you will see that the pool you, it's it, it's starting. In the beginning, you see it's, it doesn't move, and then you do it, and then it's moving. Okay, so this is uh, the main thing about the superficial fascia: scar tissue, tattoos, and burn. Okay, anyone has question about the anatomy or the effect of the cervical fascia, of the superficial level? I'm just doing a short summary. It's all the muscle, the mimic muscle of the face. Okay. It's continue all the way down to all over the body, okay? And it's lie between the skin and the muscle. And there's one more thing that I want to show you about the cervical fascia that I forgot. I, I found that a lot of headaches come from the, super, from the superficial layer, layer because there is a muscle called the, the occipital frontalis, okay? It's the muscle over here. Right to show you. This one. You see the frontalis muscle here. Some you see here occipital frontalis. When this muscle is contracting, is doing like uh, this kind of moving, compress the head. Okay? And this muscle is part of the superficial layer of the fascia that can get contracted because of any dysfunction in all of the body in this layer of this plane of dysfunction. You, you can have a tattoo on the leg that can create a dysfunction in the occipital frontalis. Okay. And now one few more interesting thing about the occipital frontalis that you see here, there is a supraorbital nerve. This is the nerve that innovate. Okay. The, the occipitalis, okay? And when you have this problem, you'll see that this nerve, if you touch here, exactly here, it's going to be sensitive. And when you're going to work on the superficial fascia, you will, and then the occipital frontalis will get released, you will see that the sensitivity in this area, this nerve will go down. And few more uh, thing about this nerve, uh, it's part of the trigeminal nerve, okay? The trigeminal nerve is a very, very important nerve in the in the cranial system and has a huge effect on the human body, okay? And is one of the main causes for headaches, okay? So you can see that sometimes people will come with you of headaches and nobody, and they, they knock their head, they did all the things, and it didn't work. You can check the tension in the occipital frontalis. Look for places that you have dysfunction in this layer of this fascial layer. You're going to inhibit, you're going to stretch this place. And in the same second, you're going to see that the tension in the occipital frontalis will get released. And the sensitivity in the supraorbital nerve that innervates this muscle also will get released. And this is one of the ways that you can find the hidden cause for headaches. Okay. 
And one last thing, this also nerve innervates the mucosa of the frontal sinus. So it's also related to sinusitis, especially people say here, I have a lot of congestion, okay? Because this is what the nerve is doing. So this is one of the main things that I wanted to tell you. So after seeing, saying that, ah, check, let's see. Uh, Owen, can I add something? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, it's also innervate uh, the conjunctiva of the eye. Yes, and correct. that uh, it can explain the eye problems or eye pains. Thank you. Yes. How long does the scar tissue in this fascia take to heal? The scar tissue, if you don't treat it, uh, it's always going to do adhesion. It's uh, scar tissue. Do it's going to heal sometime for years, but always it's going to have an adhesion. And if you don't take care of it, it can create a lot of dysfunction. Botox, uh, it's create a lot of problem. I uh, don't remember when I last treated someone with Botox, but in my logic, it will create a lot of dysfunction for sure. Any more question? No, good. Car after. Okay, just a second. They asked me about the Syrian. Okay. Okay. Uh, they asked me about, I'll just to read the question, scar after operations such as myonomatomics and cesarean section, do, do they have an impact on the superficial fascia mainly or through deeper layer? What effect can they have? Okay, so most of the time I see that more deeper layer is dysfunctional, but this you need to check. I don't like to make an assumption. There is a test for every different layer of the fascial system. And you need to check which layer is the dysfunctional, okay? Because it can affect the superficial layer, but it can also affect the other layer. And usually it's affect the more deeper. And what I saw is that most of the time, it's create a lower back pain, a lot of lower back pain. I, uh, I treat it through, the, through working on this uh, scar tissue. And if, uh, I don't know, Funda, if you like, there is a YouTube uh, treatment that I did, someone with uh, lower back pain, and I just touch her cesarean section and all her their, her pain in the back disappear in the same second. And uh, maybe I will upload it later if someone wants to see. Good. Uh, any other question? No? So the anatomy and the... Uh, and the connection is clear to everyone? Yes? Good. You can still ask question if you like. Good. So here you see the trigeminal nerve and the supraorbital nerve here. Okay, so we go to the deep cervical fascia, and we're going to talk about the superficial level of the deep cervical fascia, okay? And this layer you see here in blue, it's called the investing layer, and it's, uh, how you say, it's covering two muscles. In front, the sternocleidomastoid, and on the back, the trapezius muscle, okay? And it's covered like a collar. You see, it's surround all of the neck like a collar. Okay, so this is what this is the anatomy of this of this uh, of this layer, and let's see why what is the clinical application for this. So the upper part of this fascia is attached here on the excel external occipital protuberance. So if you touch on the back of your head, you see that there is a small bump, and this bump is critical in ICS for diagnosis, and in a second I will show you why, okay? 
The other uh, component is the hyoid bone, okay? So we have here the external occipital protuberance. In front, we have the hyoid bone. In inferior direction, we have, let's say, the clavicle, the sternum, the manubrium, the acromion, and in the front, we have the mandible, okay? This is where this fascia is attaching to this bone, okay? And now let's see, this is uh, like very summarized. And in the posterior way, it's the, the nu nuclei. Okay, so here we see again the investing layer. You see it here and here. Now you see here how it's also uh, how it's attaching to the mandible and it's covering the submandibular gland, okay? And the parotid gland, okay? This is another uh, small detail about the investing layer. Now, this layer of fascia, because of its connection to the external occipital protuberance is affecting all of the dural tension in the vault. In the, in the, you see here is where the internal, you see here internal occipital protuberance, it's the exactly opposite from the inside. Here you see this is the posterior view. This is the tantarium cerebelli, this is the dura. And just here, just in, in, in the, the external, in the, the outside, you have the fascia, and the fascia is pulling from out. So the dura need to balance it by contracting from within. And then there is a, like a balance of forces between the tension of this fascia that through the trapezius that attaching here in this area, the external occipital protuberance is affecting of the body and then the dura trying to balance it. Okay, so this tissue, this layer, the, the investing layer has a lot of effect on the dural tension, but it's two-way street. If you have tension here in the dura, it's going to pull from inside. And then this fascia will need to contract in order to balance the forces. And then you will see a fascial dysfunction. And this fascial dysfunction is because of dural dys dysfunction. This is what I told you about this interconnection between the cranial system and the fascial system and between the fascial system and mainly the dural, the dural system, okay? Uh, I hope it was clear. You see here, this is here, the internal occipital protuberance and just external to it here, you see, this is the internal and here, this is the external. And now these two forces try to balance each other, okay? Is this idea clear for everyone? Because this is very important in balancing the investing layer. Just a second. Is this subtle and fulcrum? No, it's not subtle and fulcrum. Subtle and fulcrum is in the anterior side of the straight sinus. So it's more, Ellen, it's more over here. You see in this vessel here, it's this area and the internal occipital protuberance is over here. Good, so let's continue. Now, you see here the free nerve, okay, you see? Here you have a nerve that's called the accessory nerve. The accessory, accessory nerve, it's the nerve that innervates the trapezius and the stem of cleidomastoid. And it's exiting from the skull here between the occiput and the mastoid process, okay? So if this suture is blocked, the accessory nerve, accessory nerve is going to be compressed. And then 
these two muscles are going to get contracted and the fascial also will get contracted. So you can see fascial dysfunction in the investing layer, but the reason for it is because of contraction of the accessory nerve that innervate these two muscles. And then what you need to do is to open this suture. And until you won't open this suture because of a car accident or I don't know what, this fascial layer is going to get stuck. Okay. Now, one last and one more important thing, the vagus nerve that you see it here is just next to the accessory nerve. So they influence each other. So when the one of them is getting stuck, also the other one is getting stuck. Okay. And I tell I can tell you that many times I will see a visceral dysfunction. And every time I see a visceral dysfunction with compression here in this suture, always 100% of the time, you will see a contraction in the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid. And when I'm going to release the inner organ, this suture is going to open and the vagus and the accessory nerve is going to get released. How do I know it? The trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid is going to get released. And a lot of people have so much tension here on the shoulder and they do a lot of massage. But a lot of the time, it's because of the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, is like over irritation of it, it's creating a chain reaction that the suture is getting pressed. And then the accessory nerve that is also exiting this point also get compressed. And then this fascial layer is getting stuck. So you see here, this layer can get stuck because of irritation of the inner organ or because of dysfunction, mechanical dysfunction between the occiput and the mastoid process. Okay? And this is two things that, again, as I told you in the beginning, when I look at the fascial system, I don't see it as a system stand by itself. I don't do only fascial diagnosis. The fascial diagnosis you see is, create, is connecting to the cranial system, to the visceral system, and then I will show you a few more other connections. Good. Any question about this? Ah, let's see. This, uh, uh, occipi occipital mastoid release. This is the name of the suture. Yeah, the jugular foramen. Yes, it is in the jugular foramen. And uh, the technique that you usually do is a technique to open the mastoid process and the occiput. So uh, as uh, Daphna is asking, this is called, this part is called jugular foramen. Okay, good. Now, few more thing about the about the investing layer. It has a, a lot of effect of the shoulder because of the connection to the clavicle, the sternum, and the scapula. Because of this fascia attaching to the hyoid and to the, the mandible, it affects a lot of the TMJ dysfunction. Every uh, misalignment of the hyoid bone or the mandible will create a, T, a TMJ dysfunction. Okay? So, again, the mechanical movement of the neck, when the trapezius and the sternocleidal mastoid is stuck, you will see the, the movement of the rotation is going to get affected. And again, the dural tension. It's affect the dural tension through the external occipital protuberance, okay? And I want you to remember that it's two-way street. Dural tension can create a dysfunction in this uh, investing layer. And the last thing, it can affect the vagus nerve. And this is very important. And we'll talk about the vagus also in, in, in the other parts of the, 
of the fascial system, of the cervical fascia. So this is the main thing about how about the investing layer. Okay, so I remind you, we have the platysma, this is the most superficial, and now we go one deeper. The, the platysma is between the skin and the muscle, and now we have the most superficial muscle, trapezius. And just a, like a side note, this fascia is again, is connected to the rest of the body, to the latissimus dorsi, to the gluteus maximus, and so on. The, the fascia here, the, the cervical fascia here is continuum all the way down. And it's in the same plane, okay? So the same plane of the trapezius and the scum, you have the pectoralis, you have the latissimus, and so on. Good. Any question until now? No, that's it. Good. Okay, second layer, the pretrachal fascia, and this is uh, this is one of my favorite. Pretrachal fascia, you can see it in blue here. You see it, and you see that is attaching to the hyoid bone, and it's also attaching to the trachea and the esophagus. Okay, and one of the most important thing about this fascia that is attaching to the thyroid. Okay, it's attaching. It's it's wrap all the thyroid gland. Okay, and it has fiber that also attach to the lungs to the floor of the lung. Okay, you see here this in red. This is the in the pretrachal fascia, okay? So some author divide this fascia into two different sections, the visceral section and the muscular section. I don't know if it's needed, but just for you to know that there is a component of visceral and component of the, of the infrahyoid uh, muscle. Now, the pretrachal fascia, you see here, this is the thyroid gland, you see it here, how it's wrapped, the thyroid gland. And then it's going to the thyroid cartilage and to the hyoid bone, okay? And this tension, this fascia also, I need to admit someone, okay. This fascia also attached to the pericord, okay? And this is, a, I will tell you in a second uh, about this uh, connection. But the thyroid gland is here. You see the, 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 the pretrachal fascia here? And how it's wrapped the thyroid gland. And when I see someone with hormonal dysfunction, the first thing that I'm going to check is the pretrachal fascia. And here you see the ligament of Berry. This is an extension of the pretrachal fascia that attached to the cericoid cartilage here, this one here. This is an extension of the pretrachal fascia. And you see that this fascia is also attaching to the pericard. So when I want to release the thyroid, I need to release it from the hyoid bone, from the cericoid cartilage, and from the pericard, okay? And I have to tell you, there is a lot of people who have hormonal issues. And sometimes it could be also hidden, people with a digestive problem or problem to sleep. And in ICS, we have a very specific uh, diagnosis to the hormonal system. And when I see that there is a dysfunction in the thyroid gland, I need to know all this connection. I need to know about the ligament of Berry. I need to know about the connection to the pericard because all of this connection, I need to free this fascia here from all its connection in order for the gland to work more eff efficient. Okay? So this is how the pretrachal fascia can affect a wide range of hormonal dysfunction. Now, According to Finet, Finet was a uh, Belgian osteopath. 
he had a theory that all the inner organ in the abdomen are moving because of a fascial continuation that starts from the peritoneum of the of the abdomen, go to the pericard, to the cervical fascia, up to the skull. And this created an axis, like a stable axis, that according to this axis, the the move there there is the movement of the inner organ. So the pretrachal fascia, and I found it a lot of the time to be true. The pretrachal fascia is one of the main link to create an axis of movement to the inner organ. So it's also affect all the inner organ. Okay. So in ICS, when I see a dysfunction in the pretrachal fascia, I'm not treating the pretrachal fascia, I'm going to check the peritoneum. And you'll see that when I will find a dysfunction in the peritoneum, the pretrachal fascia many times is going to get released. And all this, there is a specific test, how you check it, okay? So this is a connection between, again, the visceral aspect and the fascia aspect. And many times, I can release an inner organ by releasing the preterachal fascia and vice versa. I can release the preterachal fascia by releasing the inner organ. Good. And again, the misalignment of the TMJ, okay? Because it's affecting the, also this and also the investing layer through the hyoid bone, okay? And now I can tell you, but now that you understand that the TMJ has a, a lot of effect on the cervical fascia, this is how one of the reasons that, one of the ways that I investigate the cervical fascia. When uh, you can try it, put your finger over here on the hyoid bone, and if you move your chin side to side, you see that the hyoid bone is moving. You see it? When the hyoid bone is moving to the left, the fascia is getting stretched. So I'm one of the ways that I'm diagnosing the preterachal fascia and all the, it's not only the preterachal fascia, it's all this plane of movement is by moving my jaw. And I can see what happened in the fascia. And this is why people with TM, TMJ dysfunction, that the problems that in, in the TMJ, they have so much problem, so much problem. And the effect is like really big. I have one of my students is a dentist that is specialized in balancing the TMJ. And he used like a small device. I don't know if he's here. His name is Fares. And he checked the position of the TMJ as a small device that in a micron. And with this, he healed a lot of people from many, many kinds of diseases. You know, and he's a medical doctor. And this is what he's doing to heal people, just realign their job. And he come to ICS because he saw that sometimes it doesn't work. But when you know this, now you can understand how the cervical fascia and the other fascial system affect the position of the jaw. So the TMJ in ICS is, a, we use it as a key component to diagnose the cervical fascia, okay? The pretrachal and the investing layer. Okay, until now, do you have any question? It was clear? Yeah, makes sense? Good. Let's see if you have a question. I will wait for a second. Oh. Good. Let's continue with the, this is what the visceral aspect of the pretrachal fascia. And now I'm going to more to the muscular aspect of the pretrachal fascia. And this fascia is called pharyngeal, pharyngeal basilar fascia. Okay, and this fascia is 
fascia that cover the esophagus and the trachea, and it's going down all the way to the um, to the mediastinum, and it's wrap the constrictor muscle, the superior constrictor of the pharynx. Okay, it's the muscle that contract your throat. Okay. And you see it here. You see pharyngeal basilar here. This is the constrictor muscle. I will show you another one. You see, this is the muscle. And you see pharyngeal basilar fascia. And you see that this fascia, where does it attach? To the base of your skull, over here. All this. Okay. So the pharyngeal basilar fascia that is part of the pretrachal fascia. The muscular level, layer of the retrachal fascia is covering the constrictor muscle, and in the end, is attaching to the base of the skull, the occiput, and to the sphenoid. And you see that this is very, very critical. And you see it here. You see, this is the constrictor muscle of the pharynx, and this is where the pharyngeal basilar fascia is attached, okay? And now, next to the pharyngeal basilar, we have another fascia that is just on the outer surface of the pharyngeal muscle here. It's called bucopharyngeal fascia. Okay, buco is because that it's attaching to the buccinator muscle. And pharyngeal is because it's covering the pharynx, the muscle of the pharynx. Okay. And again, here, this is from Netter. This is the area you see in red here. This is the area that this fascia is attaching. And you see that is all this pretrachal fascia is attaching to the base of the skull through the pharyngeal basilar. And I want to show you one more, the bucopharyngeal is again attaching to the pharyngeal muscle, okay? And in the end, is attaching here to the body of the sphenoid. Okay, so you see that the pretrachal fascia in the end is attaching to the occiput and to the sphenoid to the base of the skull. Okay, so this is the pharyngeal muscle and the blue here, this is the bucopharyngeal, just deep to the constrictor muscle of the pharynx here. See, this is the muscle and this is here, the fascia, this is the bucopharyngeal fascia. And here again, You see the bucopharyngeal fascia is here, attaching to the sphenoid. Now, the bucopharyngeal fascia, wait, wait, you see this muscle, the buccinator? You see here, this is where the fascia is attaching. Okay, this is the superior constrictor. Okay, and here there is something called a raffet, like a, a dense tissue. It's called pterygoid mandibular raffet. And this raffet is attaching to the sphenoid and to the mandibula. And this is one of the reasons that this fascia is, can affect the position of the sphenoid. Okay? I'm just going, you see this here, here, this part here, you also can see it in the dentist. This is the pterygo mandibulo raffi, okay? That it attach the sphenoid to the mandibula. And you see here, they do some injection and sometimes with some, uh, I say, operation in the mouth can create a lot of dysfunction. And this is part of the pretrachal fascia. This is part of the bucopharyngeal. Okay, and this is one of the things that I check when I try to balance the TMJ. You see, this is the raffe here, and this is the constrictor muscle. And you see, this is the sphenoid here. You see where I'm pointing here? 
So this fascia is attaching to the sphenoid and can has a lot of effect on the sphenoid and the occiput. And I don't know how many people here are familiar with the cranial mechanism, but the joint between the occiput and the sphenoid is the main axis in which all the other cranial bones are moving. So this is the main objective of balancing the cranial vault. And just one uh, side note, according to Sutherland, and I accept what you say, the cranial mechanism is the one mechanism that, the main mechanism that is responsible for the self-healing mechanism of the body. This is the reason that cranial, the cranial mechanism is so critical. And the sphenobasilar, the joint between the occiput and the sphenoid, this alignment is so critical. And because of the bucopharyngeal fascia and the pharyngeal basilar fascia attaching to these two places, they are influence the position of this joint. And after you understood this, you can understand that when I check the head and I see the position of the joint between the occiput and the sphenoid, I can tell you exactly which fascia is stuck. Because every position of this joint creates a different kind of dysfunction in the cervical fascia. And in ICS, we like, what I did, I systemized each dysfunction in the, this joint, which fascia is getting stuck. Okay, so, the cervical fascia can create dysfunction in, in, the, in this joint. So in order to release the cranial system, I need to release the pretrachal fascia, but the opposite is also true. When I have a dysfunction in the cranial mechanism and this joint is dysfunctional, I can put my hand, see what position, and according to the position, we have eight different positions, I can tell you exactly which fascia is stuck in the neck. Okay. And one, one last thing. When, one of the things that I want in ICS is like uh, precision. That if me and all the other students are making tests, we all have the same conclusion. So if someone tell me in level seven that he found a different uh, dysfunction in the, this joint, he can check the cervical fascia and see if it was correct. Because for every dysfunction in the cervical in the, the in the occiput and the sphenoid, there is I say attached to it a very specific dysfunction in the cervical fascia. Okay, and again we see here the joint between the occiput and the sphenoid. And this is when this you see it's like a, like a wheel that when the occiput and sphenoid are moving, the rest of the cranial bone are moving and the sacrum. This is the reason why these two bones are the main axis of the cranial mechanism. And the one, the main fascia that is responsible, responsible for the position is the pretrachal fascia. Okay. Any question about the pretrachal fascia? No, good. I hope everything that I say is very clear, uh, that you are not shy to ask questions. And uh, if so, feel free to ask me questions. Let's see. Yes, good. Acupuncture can damage. I don't know. I hope not. I, I my knowledge of the acupuncture is not so big, but I have a lot of students that are acupuncture and they do great work, and I really appreciate this method of healing. So I believe every method that you use it in incorrect way can damage.
but generally I really like acupuncture. Good. Hey, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, one patient came to me with a bluff, bluff, blepharospasm, and maybe it's part of his a very syndrome they call Maggie or Meg, Meg. Anyhow, do you can we help her with your method? Uh, Uncontrol uh, contraction of of the face mainly. I have to tell you, like I don't treat the problem. I treat people. The main purpose in ICS is to help the body to create anatomical, physiological, mechanical condition in which the body can heal himself. So for me, I don't care, you know, people can come with many physical alignment. My job is to diagnose the body and to find out why the body cannot heal himself. What is blocking it? And I, I do the treatment according to the diagnosis and not according to the to the complaint. So mm -hmm. I'm willing to take anyone. I have people with cancer, people with disc herniation, people with eye problem, people with heart problem, dysfunction. I'm willing to to check it. And a lot of them get benefits because I don't look in one place. I look at the system, how all the system work together. And I try to understand which system it doesn't doesn't work. And this is where I treat. So okay. we're asking me about a specific uh, you know, condition. Uh, I, I don't look at the at the body this way. Just a second, there is more. Uh, but, ah, this is why you ask. Okay. I hope it's I hope I answer your question. Uh, yes? Okay. Yes, you did. Thanks. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the last, the most deep fascial uh, layer that's called prevertebral fascia. You see here, the prevertebral fascia, it's all the fascia that cover here, the deep muscle of the neck. Okay. All this. So it's all the multifidus, the spleni, the scalene. The, we have the longus coli here. All this is covered by the prevertebral fascia. So it's covered all this muscle and it has an attachment on the transverse process of the cervical spine. And this is very critical. And not only on the cervical spine, you see that it comes until T3, T4. This is the prevertebral fascia here. So you see, so the prevertebral fascia, it also continues until T4. Okay, here it's uh, T3. Now, I can tell you that when I study osteopathy, I learned how to feel the cervical spine by moving the transverse process and to see the alignment of the spine. This is one of the way to check or to assess the position of the spine, of the cervical spine. But when I was young, I did a, like, a lot of adjustment. And all the time, not all the time, most of the time, the vertebra came back to the wrong place. And what I found that because of this attachment to the transverse process, it will pull the spine out of alignment. So without balancing, the prevertebral fascia, I cannot hold this, the cervical spine in the right position. You can release here, you can do knack, you can do adjustment, HVT, but if the prevertebral fascia is in tension, it will pull the transit process, and again, it will shift the spine, the vertebra, into the wrong position. So for me, to when I found a mechanical dysfunction, in the cervical spine, a mechanical, that I use my osteopathic test and see misalignment in the cervical spine, the first thing that I'm going to check is the prevertebral fascia, okay? Now, the prevertebral fascia, you see here the scalene muscle, 
This is the scalene muscles. And now the prevertebral fascia is covering, it, it, it's becoming the axillary fascia. You see, it's one fascia that cover the brachial plexus. Okay? So all dysfunctional, all the nerve dysfunction in the arm, like tingling, weaknesses, and so on, one of the reasons for pressure on the brachial plexus and on the all the nerve of the head is tension in the prevertebral fascia. Okay? And I will show you one more. You see, this is how you see the uh, pre the prevertebral fascia that cover the scalene, and then it's become the axillary sheath, the axillary fascia that cover the brachial plexus. So if you want to, re to release the arm, to have a good neural connection uh, condition and good vascular condition to the arm, you need to release the prevertebral fascia. Okay. And again, when I, because it's one layer, you see that the prevertebral fascia is continuous with the axillary fascia and then to the brachial fascia and so on. So when I am assessing the prevertebral fascia, I can see that sometimes it comes from the arm. So the, the, as I told you in the beginning, the, the cervical fascia, the assessment of the cervical fascia give me a, a, a clue to the, to the condition of the, all the fascia in the arm. When you have a fascia, the fascia dysfunction in the arm, the prevertebral fascia is stuck. Now I need to see who affects who. The fascia in the arm stuck the prevertebral or the opposite. The prevertebral stuck the muscle of the arm, the fascia of the arm. And this is the diagnosis that we are doing. Okay. Now, the prevertebral fascia is attaching the fiber of the scalene anterior is attaching to the Simpson fascia. It's called also the suspensory ligament of the lung. And this fascia is attaching to this fascia here, to the Simpson fascia. And I can tell you that everyone who is smoking for a long time has a dysfunction in the Simpson fascia and in the prevertebral fascia. And while I'm going to release the lung, I will do visceral technique for the lung, the prevertebral fascia is going to get through it. And I can tell you, I can share with you that I, I treated a lot of neck dysfunction and arm dysfunction through releasing the Simpson fascia and releasing the lung. In many ways, the, the work on the lung is composed from many factors, but this is how I can release the lung and then the neck is getting better, and the arm is getting better, and the carpal tunnel is getting better, and so on and so on. And the connection is the prevertebral fascia. And it's connection to the super to the Simpson fascia. Okay. So if someone comes and tells me that he's smoking and he's complaining about the neck or the arm, this is the first thing that I'm going to check. Good. We have again that it's connected to the scalene, and here you see the the dome of the lung and how it's connected to the ribs and to the spine, and this is the reason why dysfunction in the lung can create dysfunction in the cervical spine. And as you see, it's related to the first uh, vertebra, to the first uh, costal. And when the first rib is stuck, it's getting pressed down. It can compress the brachial plexus. Okay. And when I release this, the tension in the brachial plexus can get released. So I see it in a lot of neural dysfunction in the arms that releasing the prevertebral fascia and the Simpson fascia is going to release. 
here again we see the connection with the first read and C7, T1. And last thing. Uh, until here, anyone has a question before I continue? Okay, let's see, just a second. Oops. Oh, I go to the chat here. I don't see any question. Good. Okay, the carotid shift. The carotid shift is a, a, like condensation of the deep cervical fascia, okay? You see it here in red. So now the carotid shift, ah, I see here someone asked a question, let's see. Thanks, some great input, but have to, okay. Thank you. Now the carotid shift is a, con a con condensation of all the cervical fascia. And this is a very critical point because it's wrapping the carotid that bring the blood to the brain, the vagus nerve, and the internal jugular vein. That is drainage all 95% of the blood from the head. Now, the carotid shift, you see it's composed from the middle layer, the deep layer and the superficial layer. So all the deep layer of the cervical fascia help to create the carotid shift. And now, if the fascia are tense, they can press the vagus. This is one of the places that the vagus is going to get compressed in the neck here because of the cervical fascia. So when people come with me with uh, RA, OA dysfunction, cancer, whatever, I want to help the vagus. And one of the ways that help the vagus nerve is to make sure that the carotid shift is balanced, that all the free layer of the cervical fascia is released. This is, I can tell you from my experience, this is the main place that it's getting stuck. But I have to tell you, I want you to remember, the cervical fascia is part of all the fascia layer. So I can see a dysfunction in the prevertebral, but it can be in other place in the body in the same layer. Let's say the psoas, okay, or the transverse abdominis. It's the same layer as the prevertebral fascia. And this is how I diagnose the fascial system. By diagnose far, four different layers of height. Superficial between the skin and the muscle. Superficial, that this is the investing layer. Deep, uh, like the pretracha, that is in the middle, and the deep one. And when I found one of these dysfunction, I want to check all of the body because it can come from dysfunction in other, other tissue in the same level. And then I'm going to release it, okay? So the cervical fascia again is critical for releasing the vagus and all the influence of the vagus nerve. I just mentioned a few. Okay, I'm talking already quite a lot. Anyone has a question on what I said until now on the prevertebral fascia? Uh, Oren, I have one question. Yes. Uh, in this uh, drawing, is the different part of the fascia are the places where the different uh, cervical layers are uh, represented? I didn't understand the question. The, the the we see the whole circle yes. and the yellow one is the superficial layer. Yes. What is the blue one and what is the, the blue the one, one is the 
the blue is deep, the deep layer is the vertebral and the middle layer is the pretrachal. Ah, okay, thank you. That's what I want to know. Thank you. Okay. Good. So here again, you see the carotid shift. How we get can get compressed because of partial dysfunction and effect in the vagus. And here you see the prevertebral fascia and how it's attaching to the base of the skull. So you see the fascia of the neck is attaching to the skull. So when I see dysfunction in the occiput of the sphenoid, every time the cervical fascia is going to get influenced. So in the end, the, to summarize what we just learned, the vagus nerve is influenced by the carotid shift. So you, we can check it in all the autoimmune disease, inflammation processes, all kinds of diseases. It's very critical to check the vagus nerve. It's helped the mechanical stability of the cervical spine. All complain of people with neck pain, headaches. It influences the endocrine system through the pretrachal fascia, okay? That has an attachment to the thyroid gland, okay? It's affecting the position of the cranial base through uh, dysfunction of the pharyngeal basilar and bucopharyngeal fascia, okay? It's created cranial dysfunction. So you see cranial dysfunction can come from the fascia but also the opposite. Cranial, fascial dysfunction can be created by cranial dysfunction. So for me, I cannot separate them. And this is the reason why I took the cranial system as the main axis of, of the diagnosis, because when I see the position of the cranial base, I know all the fascia that is stuck in the body all of them and i know all the muscles that is going to get to, are going to be sensitive so again it's the cervical spine is the main diagnosis for the whole fascia system so i can check here the pretrachal fascia and i can see a dysfunction and for now i'm going to check all the connection of the pretrachal fascia so it gives me an access to see the whole of the fascial system, okay? And again, it's one of the structures that they create an axis of movement to the visceral organ. So it's again, the fascial system, especially the pretrachal, it's helped the general health of the inner organ by establishing a stable axis that they can move upon it. Okay, this like in a few points why I chose like the, the cervical fascia because it's, I use it a lot in my treatment, a lot, okay? And you see it like has integration with the cranial system, the visceral system, and the mechanical system. And all of them, they work together. We just need to see who is the influence who, okay? And this is what we do in ICS. Okay, any uh, question before we continue? I have a few more things to say about ICS and what we're going to do. Let's see? No. So, if it was interesting for you and everything that I say just makes sense and you want to know more about how to do it actual, not in theory, Okay, first you can go to the online video that we have in YouTube. We have a lot of demonstration that I did on, on patients that you can see it on live, how it's working live. Okay, we have a newsletter that you can subscribe and then I'm going to work to tell you all kind of, uh, uh, time I take a subject and I see it in the bigger picture, okay? 
we have one day intro seminar that uh, we're going to explain about the ICS method, about how the touch is made in, how to how we give treatment to the neck, how to improve our sensitivity. And the best way, of course, is we have 120 hour courses that if one, someone really wants to know how to do this thing, how to diagnose the whole system of the body, all of them, as the, as the cranial is the main axis, this is the course for you. Because in these courses, it's not about the cranial system. You see, you have to learn this, the, the fascial system, the endocrine system, the visceral system, the mechanical system, because all of them are combining together. We just need to know who is affecting who. And this is what we do in ICS. So in this uh, short seminar, we give like I give like a short anatomical explanation about the neck. Then we get a lot of practical tool how to uh, feel, how to uh, enhance our uh, touch, our palpation. And then uh, we go in pairs and we do all kind of techniques for the neck. And in the end, we do I will do a demonstration on live on some. Uh, on some of people the participant to show you how it works. And if someone is interested, like I told you in the YouTube, you can see there is quite a lot of this uh, demonstration. So we have this seminar in Thailand. I'm now in Thailand, in Kopangan, and on the 23rd. So everyone who is coming is uh, to Kopangan will have a 20% uh, discount. If uh, you sign up uh, today until midnight, uh, so you're welcome if, if it's interesting for you. I promise you it's going to be very, very... How long is it uh, on the 23rd? How, how many days? No, it's one day seminar. It's like five hours. So just to give a taste about ICS, about our touch, how we think, to give a practical tool to treat the neck. This is like a five hour uh, seminar. It's like a short seminar just to give you a taste about ICS, like practical yes. test. Uh, okay. And we have another one, another seminar in uh, Norway, in Oslo on the 27th of January. And again, the people that live in Europe, you can come. Uh, a wonderful osteopath named uh, Isaac is going to do the this uh, seminar is uh, learning with me for many years and he really understand ICS in a very good way and he also going to do it in uh, Norway this one day seminar and after this we have also in Israel but this will be in April May in a few months and the the courses are built for nine different courses and every course is a different system Okay, so we have a course, we have the foundation, we have a course on the endocrine system and the dural system, we have a course on the visceral system, a course on the spine, and so on. In this program of ICS, we're learning how to balance, diagnose, and treat everything. Lymph. I have a question. Yes. Um. What? I know that there is a. I'm not that there is also a fascia manipulation class. I mean, could you like say something about the differences? Or... Yes, fascia manipulation. It's a different technique to treat the fascia, and I have a different perspective how to treat the fascia. There are many different. As Tom Myers has a different, Steco has a different way. There are many people found uh, a good way how to work with fascia. And in ICS, we work on the fascia in a different way. I don't work on the fascia as an isolated system. I see it as an integrated system that is connected, as you saw, mechanically to the cranial vault, to the dura, to the inner organ. Okay, And this is the reason why I don't see this, the fascial system is one system that influence everything. No, I want to see who influence the, the, the fascial system. And this is my approach. 
all the other approaches are wonderful. It's just a different perspective. So fascial manipulation, it's a, I think it's the core. Wonderful system, but in a different uh, way to see things, okay? Let me just finish this and then you can ask me all the questions. Uh, in these uh, courses, we created an app with all the technique of film and all the diagnosis of film. And every course like this has about a book, about 150 or 200 pages. So all the material is very systemized with a book and I film all the techniques and all the diagnosis in one place, okay? So ISIS is a very systemized system. It's a very systemized method, okay? There is a lot of algorithm that it means that all of us need to get the same answer to one question, why the patient has pain? Why his body cannot heal? And we have, these courses in two places at the moment, in Thailand, in Copangan, and the 12th to the 2nd of February, and in Norway, between the 19th and the 28th of April. And hopefully when Israel will be better in September, October, I hope that everything will be okay in Israel. This is where I'm going, to, this is the day for the 120 hour course, okay? This is like, uh, like an overview about ICS. And if someone wants to learn more, we have uh, the YouTube channel, the newsletter. You also can contact me directly through the email if you have any question. And uh, yeah. Okay, let's see if there is any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No. The Kef, uh, thank you. And I will share a link in the WhatsApp to the YouTube channel. I will send it uh, in, in the... Yes, this uh, treatment is suitable for children. And now I also uh, send a link for the seminar, for the one day seminar. Any other question you want to know about the cervical fascia, about what I said about, about ICS? Okay. Thank you very yes, much. Can Thank I ask something? Yes. Yes. So yes. I was wondering, also I saw somebody ask this, but I don't know if you, if you answered before. Uh, the connection for headaches and migraines, people who have lots of headaches, it's connected also to this fascia? Again, as I Again, said, as I said it's, it's, it's connected to the, uh, the, the investing layer because the occipital frontalis, when it's compressed, it's like compressing the head, okay? And this uh, two muscle is part of the superficial uh, layer. Okay, so if someone has a problem in the superficial layer, this muscle can get compressed and also irritate the trigeminals that is also one of the main causes to uh, headaches. Okay. I hope I answered this question. Imagine that when you don't read the private for the only. Do you think that it many cases treat the fascia is enough to ask you to hear of it? Uh, yeah, it every uh, someone asked me that you mentioned that when you don't treat the prevertebral fascia and only do osteoarticular adjustment, the lesion often come come back. Do you think that in many cases treating the fascia is enough? Just curious to hear your perspective. It's not what I think I do for everything. I do a test, okay? When I treat the vertebra, when I see this function in the cervical spine, I diagnose it in five different levels. I told in the beginning, 
it could can it can get stuck because of muscle, the multifidus, because of the fascia joint, because of the pervertebral fascia, because of the CSF, and because of the spinal cord. I want to see which tissue create the dysfunction. And every tissue has a different treatment. And when I found the correct level of dysfunction, it's enough. It doesn't come back. And sometimes the osteoarticular adjustment will do the job when the problem is in the fascia joint, when the two joints are really stuck. And not stuck because of the multifidus is holding them, and not stuck because of the pervertebra is uh, holding it. So the main thing is diagnosis. So in ICS, I do a diagnosis according to five different layers. And this is what, this is how I choose my technique, and this is the reason why it doesn't come back. So who asked this? Daphne. Okay, Daphne. I hope it answers your question. Okay. Any other question before we leave? Oh, good. So thank you everyone. It was great uh, talking to you. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. I will send you in the WhatsApp group all kind of information about uh, the seminar and about the YouTube channel and everything that you want to know. And if you have questions or anything else, you can also contact me uh, personally.